Hello everyone, welcome to Amplify Women in Research. I'm very excited today to have Dr. Maureen McDonald from McMaster University with us. Uh, Dr. McDonald is the Dean of Science at McMaster University and a researcher in exercise physiology with a specialty in cardiovascular physiology. Thanks for being here, Dr. McDonald. It's lovely to see you, Shilpa. Um, so tell us a little bit about your start, because you have a, an interesting story of where it all began for you in science. Yes, um, so I did my undergrad degree at Acadia University. I'm from Nova Scotia and I did it in chemistry. And um, like many students, I knew that I was interested in science, but I, I didn't really know what I could do with that or even particularly what area of science. Acadia was great because it was a small environment and in first year I got to sample all the sciences. And frankly, if I'm honest, I decided to do chemistry because it was the course that I got the highest mark in my first year. I know, not a great decision-making process. Um, but uh, what happened was in my second year, uh, I was taking some courses in science and the Dean of Science at Acadia um, actually came to one of my soccer games. I played soccer at Acadia and he had just arranged for some exchanges in uh, at Acadia and in science uh, with Dundee University and he came up to me after the soccer game and said listen I just arranged these new exchanges they're for third year students I know that you're a chemistry major and you're in science and you should apply for one and I thought oh that sounds really exciting and so I went to meet him and he, I filled out an application and it turns out I was selected to go on this exchange in my third year uh, to do my third year chemistry in Dundee um, but he also said uh, okay because you'll be missing and because you're a chemistry student if you're interested in doing a thesis in your fourth year when you come back you should apply for these scholarships in the summer to do some of the research before you go and those scholarships were the NSERC USRAs that still exist so such a small individual connection from the Dean of Science which is pretty neat to me now uh, being in that role someone who took the time to reach out and suggest some things like that totally expanded my world and changed the perspective. Um, so you might be wondering, okay, how did you go from that? Because that summer I did my, this work after my second year in physical chemistry with Dr. John Roscoe. Um, and up in kinesiology. The truth was third year chemistry in Dundee was a program that was chemistry all the time. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, action Shilpa. And when I came back, um, I completed all my chemistry courses. So I took an elective in anatomy and physiology from someone in, at the time, the phys ed department, um, Gary Ness. Uh, and uh, uh, I just thought it was fascinating. I talked to him about what I should do when I finished at Acadia, and he suggested kinesiology. And he actually suggested the University of Waterloo. So I applied there and I ended up going to do uh, my master's in kinesiology at Waterloo and eventually my PhD there. Um, so really these individual suggestions by people who took an interest in um, my career pathway and my interests made a tremendous difference to me. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love stories like that where it's one person sort of pivots your, your whole career, right? Like that's, that's fantastic. And that's why I think it's so important for us to make sure we try and make some of those connections and have those conversations with folks, right? Um, so, so it's interesting. So you went from chemistry into cardiology and, and, and have had a very successful research career. What was your most cited paper or like the biggest project, the most successful project you'd say? Okay, um, I'm just texting all, all my kids in my house to make sure they're not using the internet so we have a good connection. You know, the things we're doing now in, in this digital age because yeah, <laughs> as all my kids wake up, they're starting to use the internet and we lose it. Um, so it's interesting, when you ask me this, I think this is a little bit telling about me um, and I had no idea what my most cited <laughs> paper was. Um, yeah, uh, so I think there are some categories of scientists who, who watch their yes. citations and those who don't. Um, so I had to look it up on Google Scholar. Um, and uh, it's a really interesting thing because 
um, my most cited uh, paper along with like all the top cited papers are some collaborative uh, exercise training studies that I did with some very close colleagues at McMaster University. Um, we all started together and we had this process that we were all researching in different areas but we knew that resources were tight and and to actually mobilize and do a training study is a huge undertaking and so if one of us was planning a training study uh, we would all collaborate together and try to figure out like a jigsaw puzzle how we could all add the components in that were related to our research and so all those top ones are, are um, the collaborative studies I have to own up to the fact that actually um, for the first 15 years of my career, I didn't initiate a single one of those training studies. Um, and there's lots of reasons for that, but I would say a lot of them actually relate to components of all the other things that I was balancing. And so I had amazing colleagues that um, in me balancing having three kids and all the other aspects, um, they took over and drove some of those aspects. Some of it was also probably due to the fact that I don't have an undergrad degree in kinesiology and so training studies are a bit foreign to me and so I learned a lot um, from them even as a faculty member. Um, if you ask me though, I think part of the question too was like what, what do I wish uh, was more cited? Um, and this I didn't have to look up because I knew this. Um, it, it, it's the studies that we uh, do, uh, a component of my research is in individuals with spinal cord injury, and it's the studies that we have conducted in individuals with spinal cord injury. Many times those are exercise training studies or acute exercise studies. Um, I think there's lots of reasons why they're not as highly cited, uh, but some of them actually uh, come across as scientific criticisms because they are in small numbers of participants um, what people perceive as the study controls you know there's no no two people with the exact same spinal cord injury and therefore the in my field um, the innervation of the blood vessels um, the difficulties in all of those control variables and actually what you can um, implement in the design of the studies I think all of those have impacts on um, how much people look to that research to cite it. Yet to me, like so much heart goes into those. The students who were willing to conduct those studies, the participants who were willing to come in and be part of those studies, um, the importance and the impact sometimes to those people's lives, just of knowing that someone is interested in their health, their well-being in, in their life is huge. Um, so I wish those studies were more highly cited. Well, it brings two interesting points together about the different kinds of scientists, right? So yes, we have these metrics like the H index and citations, but those don't necessarily indicate the impact of the work you've had, right? So I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, some of the work that we do might not get as cited, uh, but it's still having an important effect on, on people and on policies potentially, right? So it's important to still keep doing that work. Um, okay, so you went from researcher and transitioned into the admin side of things and are now the Dean of Science at McMaster. Can you tell us a little bit about the decision to make that transition and how it's worked out and if you're still able to do research or, or what's going on with balancing the two things together? Um, Good question. There's lots of things. Go back to, to why. Still okay? Uh, you're cutting out a bit, but I think you're good now. <laughs> okay, let me just. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about you. I don't know what happens sometimes. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Everyone's uh, waking up. <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, so uh, why did I decide to do this? Um, I. Uh, the, the short answer is, I'm not sure I was intentional about it at any time. I can tell you for sure. I, oh, I see that you're frozen here now. Um, Let me just see if there's anything else I can do here. Let me just see if there's anything I could do here, Shilpa, and then I will answer the question. Okay. We can. Okay, there. I think it's a little better. All right. um, 
Okay, in answer to your question, um, it wasn't anything intentional. For sure, I didn't grow up and say, when I grow up, I want to be a dean. Um, I think I was like all of you, perhaps ex for the exception of the dean at Acadia, who, um, oh, it's frozen again. Oh, I can hear you. Okay, maybe it's just on my side. <laughs> I don't know. All right, I'll just keep going this time. I'll start again. Um, so it wasn't anything intentional. I didn't grow up saying I want to be a dean, perhaps except for that wonderful reach in by the dean at Acadia. I, I really didn't even know what the dean did. Um, and at really, even as a faculty member in my first few years at McMaster, I had no interaction with the dean. So I, I wouldn't have aspired to do that. Um, but I think in an academic career, just like for students, there are opportunities to have influence beyond just um, the components of your degree um, or your job. And those can come in many forms. They can come with professional societies, they can come with community organizations, they can come with committee work. And what I saw was a pattern was that I did get tremendous satisfaction from those types of things. Um, that satisfaction, if you talk to my siblings and my family might say that I like to organize everyone around me. <laughs> um, and that would probably be true. But I also saw that I had some skills and skills that were building and that in in that interest and capability that I was having an influence in another way. Um, and so uh, I started to have some sequential opportunities at McMaster University where I could see that I, I thought I was bringing something to the table and leaving the, the situation or the organization better than it was um, before I got there. And that was really empowering and really satisfying. Uh, despite all that, very interestingly, when I, the job of Dean of Science came open at McMaster University, I did not contemplate applying. Um, and there are a number of reasons, but the primary one was by that point, I'd seen a little bit about the job and frankly, it looked like a job that I couldn't imagine anyone would want. Mainly due to the fact that it appeared to have no boundaries. It appeared that uh, people could request things of the Dean, the Dean's time, their energy, their commitment um, could come from all directions at all times with an expectation that they would deliver to everyone. And um, that's not the way I like to run my life. As I said, I'm pretty organized, but I also have like some core values where my family really matters to me, my health and my wellness, my friends, um, creativity, my research, my students. And I just thought there, there's not a positive trade off to that. A great thing happened. Once again, a senior administrator reached out to me and the provost at the time reached out to me and suggested that I apply. And I told him I wasn't interested and he said why and I told him and he said okay can we engage in a conversation about how this job might change so that people like you would be interested in applying and he was very smart because in looking at the structure of the job I got interested in the job but it did open a whole conversation about what I thought I would need to be able to want to do the job and be successful at it um, and so I did go through the interview process and, and uh, um, process of where I was selected, but it also facilitated lots of conversations um, and has continued to facilitate those uh, where I continually, and it's not, it's not seamless, right? My life's as messy as anybody else's. And if you're a student thinking, okay, you know, that looks awesome. Everybody's <laughs> life goes like this and you tip over and too much and then you rein it back into uh, control and um, you're continually adapting those things but I feel like fundamentally about being open about what your values are and what you're interested in it, in life and how you you need things to be structured to be successful is really important and it's important for people more power in in positions to be open about that because there are so many people that don't have um, in the power dynamics, even the voice to, to say that. Um, and so I find it's really interesting. I'll still, when I get a request for something that I feel like is going to tip me over, when it's coming from someone above me, I have a hard time speaking up.
And I, then I think, oh my goodness, if I'm having a hard time speaking up, what about that student? Um, mm -hmm. What about the, the student, uh, the undergrad student, someone from an underrepresented group, an equity seeking group, like what does that look like? And so I think the more those conversations can be open, the, the better for everyone. Um, well, it's reassuring to hear that the conversations are even happening now, right? Like that you were able to start that conversation and say, the job is appealing but there's certain aspects of about it that are just you know not going to work or don't jive with my life because i think that's part of the reason a lot of women and, and underrepresented groups didn't initially go into these positions right like it's just it's a lot to balance and you know it has to align with your core values so it's really reassuring to hear that those conversations are starting to happen right and to remember that oftentimes jobs and opportunities look like the way they look just because that's the way they've evolved and they've always been. And mm -hmm. if you start to ask people, why is it like that? Why does it have to be done that way? Oftentimes people are very open to that conversation. It's just the fact that we haven't instigated the conversation in the past. Um, I love this job, actually, it's wonderful. Um, and I'm saying that despite the fact that the last three months has been kind of a roller coaster for administration. Um, and uh, you're right, I am uh, committed to continuing my research program because I um, am pretty transparent about the fact that I was never that instructor in the front of the class that everyone would say, oh, that's my favorite instructor in this big lecture hall. And, you know, I, you know, organization was my, my thing and I could organize a course like anything and I could yes. deliver a, a lecture, but I, you know, I, I wasn't the, 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 the performer at the front. Um, the, the part of my career that I get the most joy out of by far is the interaction with the students in my research program. Um, and I learn so much from them every day about why we're doing what we're doing. And just still, like I just had a student who did a really huge study and she just got all of her data analyzed and it was so exciting to talk mm -hmm. about her data. Um, so I, I do, I'm still trying to make sure that I carve that out. It, it's, I'm trying to be transparent with my students because it looks different than it used to look. Yeah. Um, I meet with them on Fridays uh, and I have it, it's pretty tightly structured, um, but I think there's some benefits to them. I try as much as possible when there's something that I've gleaned in all the other tables I'm at to transmit it back to them. I was telling them the other day, um, we're going to try to do a collaborative review together. And I said that I want them all to try to use some project management software because I think project management is a skill, whatever career they go into and let's be intentional about it. So let's look at project management software because we're all doing this remotely. Let's, let's build up those skills. And I, I only know that because I'm working with people who are doing project management. So hopefully there's a positive trade off for them. Oh, I'm sure. I think it's that whole, you know, your role modeling um, a, a fantastic sort of in a fantastic way, right, to be able to balance those things and to do them well. I think that's the key, right? People take on a lot and you start because there's too much to do. Um, so it's good to, to know your strengths and choose those tasks and jobs that you enjoy, but that you can do well. I think one of the dangers that I see, and this is something I wanted to make sure I tell you, is that I read somewhere that as people move up in an organization, they tend to be talking way more than they're listening, um, which I think is really dangerous. And I think it's a natural tendency that we have to fight against. But I think that's one thing that I, I want to make sure there's you know, that we talk about that we should be listening to everybody and we should be paying attention. And I learned that from you. So I don't know if you remember this years ago, we were at a CSEP banquet and they had just announced the honor award winner. And um, it was your supervisor uh, from Western, Don Patterson, who received it. And we were all so pleased to see that. But you came up to me and said you looked through the program and noticed that there had never been a female honor award winner. And did I have any ideas? Had I nominated anyone? And did I have any ideas? And I have to say, that was a fundamentally changed my perspective on many things. I actually went home and nominated a female uh, for that. But I hear your voice all the time. Um, I think about that. I look at lists and I have to tell you, for whatever reason, I didn't look at lists that way before. 
um, of award winners. And I look at it all the time now and I'm at those tables and I can influence that. And so that's just a thing that you were able to step into that space to come and talk to me about that, that you noticed it. And, and that I think those are the types of things that, that we have to make sure keep happening. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> to hear that because sometimes you do feel like you're uh you know beating on the same drum <laughs> and going on and on so it's to hear that sometimes it actually does affect change right when you're when you're having these conversations um so that's a good sort of segue to the last sort of thing i wanted to talk about which is uh whether you have a message for for women in research either getting started or have hit that mid point any tips or tricks for them yeah, so um, I think that one of the main messages that I see here is um, to try to go back again to your core values. And there's lots of ways to do that, but to think carefully about what matters most to you and not to get too distracted by, as you said, all these external performance measures and all these external um, uh, metrics uh, and even advice like about what you should be spending your time on and, and your the initiatives. I think if you uh, are really clear on your core values and uh, your motivators and your aspirations, it will help you to be more purposeful in, in your commitments, in your capacity, in your decision making. And then I think you'll, you'll feel more satisfied. You'll feel like you're more in control because I think that's one of the most difficult things is when you perceive that that you could be doing all the right things and receiving all the advice and trying to do it all, but it still might not give you the outcomes that you deserve and uh, that you aspire to. But I think if you have been a bit more in control of um, the framework for making those decisions, that will help. And so that's what I found for me is that in those times, particularly when larger decisions, but even smaller decisions, if I just can step back and remind myself, I'm the only one who knows me the best, right? Um, uh, let's not crowdsource this. Let's just think about me, have a little bit of quietness, um, that that has served me better than kind of the scattershot listening. And actually, Shilpa, I think it's harder for people now than it ever was um, because we're bombarded with information. We're bombarded with advice. Um, and I think it's even harder for the student trainees um, uh, because uh, they haven't discerned those layers of advice yet. Um, so I think that's one thing that I've seen you do so intentionally, right? Um, and then it's clear when you've made a commitment, there's a thread through it all. There's a thread through why you're doing this podcast. Of course, as soon as you said you were doing it, it was very authentic. Um, and it makes people want to participate with you uh, because they can see that that's connected to exactly who you are. Um, so I think it will help you, but it'll help people come along with you too. Yeah, I think that's so important because otherwise, like you, like we, we were talking about before we started recording, it, it, it's exhausting because we're all overworking. But if you're doing things that you're truly, you know, interested in and passionate about and that bring you some joy and meaning, then it, it, right? you, can, you can handle an extra hour because you truly care about what you're doing, right? And it's a, it's a vulnerable conversation to talk to others about what your values are. We did it, I learned a thing that I had been in a leadership program where we had to identify our core values and it was an activity and I took it back to my lab. And we did the activity where everybody identified their top core values and then we were trying to identify them for our lab group. Um, and it was a great reminder for me and I've done this with a bunch of groups now. There's a core value that comes out in students um, many times that almost never comes out in um, faculty or staff and that is fun um, and that's that's quite telling right of course and and we almost identify that as a value of younger people um, but I think it's a really important one when did we let fun drop off of our core values and and why did we let it drop off and why isn't it part of the conversation and so I think just doing those exercises to me reminded me that um, when I talk to the students, yeah, they love science, they want to achieve 
in their careers, they want to do all these things, but they also want to have times where we're having fun. Um, and so it was a real reality check for me to make sure that I'm giving space for that um, when I interact with them. I love that. I think we should all have fun. It's, it's funny how we do, we totally forget how to have fun, right? So I, this has been really fun. I thank you very much for your time. Um, to do this interview. I think it's been very interesting. I've learned a lot. And, and I think, like I said, there's lots of women out there who are thinking about transitioning from research into admin and are worried about losing their research because like we chatted about, it's, it's a big source of joy for so many of us. So I think this will be very helpful to lots of people. So thank you so much for taking the time to do this. It was wonderful to see you, Shilpa.